Death of a Game, Warhammer Online, Age of Reckoning. Death of a Game is a series in which I, Nerd Slayer, take a look at games over the past years that were either a death of a franchise or even a company and attempt to speak about the history of said game up until its ultimate demise. I want to show you guys the most objective experience I can, so I will refrain from wearing my nostalgia goggles. The criteria behind the game being dead would be A, it's actually dead, B, it had a sudden mass exodus of players and never recovered, or C, the game never launched or the company dissolved. At the end of each of these videos, I hope you guys will have a better understanding of why and how the game in question failed. Perhaps knowing such can teach us a valuable lesson on the video game industry or at least enough to keep us from throwing money at such games or companies in the future. In order to have a better understanding of the history of Warhammer Online, we have to look at the company behind it, Mythic Entertainment, or as it was later known by, EA Mythic, or Bioware Mythic, or Mythic Entertainment again, and then Bioware Mythic, and then Mythic Entertainment, why did I keep changing the... Mythic was founded by Mark Jacobs as an online game development company. Originally known as Adventures Unlimited Software in 1984, it focused early on creating online versions of games like Diplomacy, and then later Dragon's Gate, which was a rather popular MUD or multi-user dungeon that ran for over 17 years. Jacobs was seen as the sort of brain of the company, the method to the madness. By 1995, Mythic Entertainment was officially formed. They had a range of FPS and online RPG games. In 2011, Mythic Entertainment launched Dark Age of Camelot, the game that really defined the company. Dark Age of Camelot had a reported $3.2 million budget and was led by Rob Denton, co-founder of Mythic and lead programmer, and Matt Fuhrer. Dark Age of Camelot was a game about realm versus realm, which was very large-scale PvP or player warfare spread across wide areas known as realms. The game was unique in that it could be almost entirely played from the perspective of a PvP player, which also known as player versus player. Dark Age of Camelot had its shortcomings, but it was able to boast as high as a 250,000 person subscriber base at one point. Dark Age of Camelot was also seen as a forefather of the PvP landscape for MMOs, and it's very positively regarded by most. Mythic Entertainment then tried an MMO named Imperator Online, but the game was never fully produced or launched, and likely led the company bleeding many of their resources. So the project came to an end in 2005 when Mark Jacobs announced that they had secured the license to make Warhammer Online from Games Workshop. Games Workshop was the company that owned the Warhammer IP. The game was announced shortly after. The Warhammer universe had existed for 20 plus years in the tabletop world, where it had board games and figurines and also tons of novels to its credit. everywhere. The dwarves fight a desperate battle against the savage greenskins. The empire is under siege by the marauding armies of chaos. And across the great ocean, the dark elves assault Ulthuan, the island home of the high elves. Faced with certain doom, elves, men, and dwarves have united their forces to form an alliance of order. The full name of the game became Warhammer Online Age of Reckoning, and Mythic Entertainment was then purchased by Electronic Arts, or EA for short, just a year after they announced the game in 2006. It's speculated this was because Mythic was running out of money to fund Warhammer Online and needed a big publisher to step in. EA renamed the company to EA Mythic, which was then renamed back to Mythic Entertainment just two years later, a few months before the launch of the game. Mark Jacobs, the founder of Mythic Entertainment, received flack for the merger because he had previously denied any allegations of a merger with Electronic Arts. Though he didn't outright lie, people felt like he was being rather much a lawyer in his statements and dodging and... The acquisition was only an acquisition in assets and a name change, according to Jacobs, and that the development of Warhammer would remain the same in the Mythic Studios located in Fairfax, Virginia. Though looking back, I'm not really sure how many people believe that. During the game's development cycle, Mythic employed a designer known as Paul Barnett to spearhead the creative directive of the game. Paul Barnett was a vivacious character, who was very well known for his Warhammer feature videos where he could make even non-fans become evangelists shortly after. 
Paul was an interesting character because he was known for saying statements like, you shouldn't play MMOs because they corrupt your way of thinking when attempting to create other MMOs. Or his staunch stance against World of Warcraft filled with quotes like, I can't tell what is flaw and what is genius in WoW, so I don't want to get sucked into copying things in case I get the wrong one. The game was launched in September 18, 2008, which as previous viewers of my first Death of a Game video would probably realize that this is rather similar to Star Wars Galaxies, being a three year development cycle, which is rather short, again, in comparison to WoW which had a five year development cycle. Also like Star Wars Galaxies, Warhammer Online launched with good success and had sold 1.2 million copies boasting a subscriber base of near 800,000. Despite an expansion launch in January 2009, called ARMS, the population had a gradual shrinkage to 300,000 just one year later. This could be in part due to the content of the expansion being mostly from the cut content that was already present in the beta version of the game, the new classes in particular. The expansion did add a new zone, but didn't add much in terms of fixing previous content or balancing the game. The number of servers in the game were then reduced to 13, a near 63 numbers of servers were shredded to consolidate for population issues as, as the game was heavily reliant on a population to play. That same year, EA announced that they would be merging Mythic Entertainment with BioWare, who had recently just been acquired by EA. They would be merged under the title BioWare Mythic as an MMO-focused branch of EA, headed by Rei Mizuka. Rei was famously known as being a co-founder of BioWare. This restructuring of the companies coincided with the announce of a new Star Wars MMO known as Star Wars The Old Republic. The joining of these companies likely was due to EA wanting Mythic to serve as a sort of advisor to Bioware, and Bioware having the chance to be involved in the currently running MMO Warhammer Online. Later in 2009, EA cut over one third of the studio's workforce as part of their infamous job calling. By 2010, Warhammer was alluded to having less of a population than its spiritual father of a game, Dark Age of Camelot. This number was rumored to be around 50,000. In an attempt to garner more interest, the Warhammer team launched a mini-content expansion that made the Skaven, a popular race in the Warhammer universe, a playable race. However, it was playable by both Order and Destruction forces, not really serving as the third faction people would have assumed it would have been, or should have been. 2011 rolled by, and the game only had three servers left. To make matters worse, the game patched in Renown Rank 100 and Cash Shop features in an attempt to go free to play. Bioware Mythic was then renamed to Mythic Entertainment, likely due to EA or Bioware not wanting to have the stain of failure on their record. On December 18th, 2013, the game was brought down based on a mutual. We both know that wasn't mutual, and also doesn't that sound familiar? Agreement from Gamers Workshop, the owner of the Warhammer IP, and Mythic Entertainment, the owner of the Warhammer Online MMO. To wrap up the conclusion of the history portion of this video, the Warhammer story is a shorter one than the, my previous Star Wars Galaxies video and leaves likely more questions as to why the game failed since there wasn't some huge exodus brought on by a single patch or update like there was present in Star Wars Galaxies. Although Warhammer didn't have an ENGE of sorts, it had rather clear reasons and patterns as to why the game did eventually fail. Let's take a look at those, but first, let's talk about what the game did well. I noticed in my previous video, I didn't make it a point to point out what Star Wars Galaxies did right, and I wanted to make it a point in this video to do that with regards to Warhammer. What Warhammer did well was PvP. It had a simple RVR system where you could level up with PvP and had skills progression specifically for PvP known as Renown Rank. And then you had PvP focused servers which allowed for PvP just about anywhere except for, you know, areas that were guarded by NPC guards. It captured the feeling of the Warhammer universe by making you feel like you were really warring against the races and factions. It took concepts that Dark Age of Camelot had made popular and it made them more accessible. This was both positive and negative. It had a strong lore that supported PvP in the game. PvP never really felt useless from a lore perspective. It always felt like you should be fighting each other. The dwarfs should be fighting the greenskins. The greenskins were taking their land. Or the humans had to fight against the chaos because they were the humans corrupted. 
The game also had bolstering in it, which allowed lower level players to be bolstered to a higher level so they could participate in higher level content. Something you see in most MMOs nowadays, like Guild Wars 2 and Lord of the Rings Online. Warhammer also had a feature of the game called the War Tomb of Knowledge. It had just about everything in the game in one easy to access place. Lore, achievements, titles, kill counts versus certain classes and factions, quest information, etc. It made the game easy to access and understand rather early on. It was a very efficient tutorial. The classes in Warhammer were all very distinct and unique. They had mirror classes, which generally served as the same class on the other side of the faction, destruction versus order, but these mirror classes weren't exact copies of each other. They had their own distinct lore and feel to them, something that unintentionally actually hurt the game in balancing ways. Healers were far more active than in most games, and you didn't really just sit back and heal the entire time. You had your own mechanics to manage. It was more active of a playstyle. In some cases, the healers had to actually do damage in order to supplement their healing. All classes had unique roles and unique feels and looks to them. The Bright Wizard and Sorcerer were ranged spellcasters who focused on dealing damage. However, their mechanic was unique because the more damage you did, the more you would either do to yourself or take in return. It was a careful balance. Or how the Chosen in the Night of the Blazing Sun had auras in which they would rotate and that these would then grant people buffs and such like that. The Warrior Priest and Disciple of Cain were melee-based healers. They had to rely on melee attacks to fuel their healing. Black Orcs and Swordmasters had stances they had to switch through, finishing in a finish ability. Ironbreakers and Blackguards had the typical hate and rage mechanic, where the more you attack, the more ability points and rage you gain, and then you can trigger more powerful abilities based off of that. The Archmage and Shaman had to balance their abilities to focus on either healing or damage. Rune Priest and Zealot had inscriptions and runes they would activate to grant heals and buffs. Slayer and Choppa, later expansion classes, had to balance their berserk mechanics. The more berserk they were, the more damage they did, but also took. Witch Hunter and Witch Elf used stealth and backstab mechanics to deal damage. White Lion and Marauder were medium armor DPS that each had unique abilities, focused on usually like things like debilitation and crowd control. Shadow Warrior and Squick Herder were ranged bow users who could either focus on ranged damage or melee damage. The Shadow Warrior having more of a ranged arrow focus while the Squig Herder had a Squig pet. The Magus and Engineer classes were utility damage dealers that focused on dots and the use of pets. Warhammer also had morale abilities which you got to use after you were in battle for some time. These abilities were unique to your class and had special effects. Think about them as MOBA's ultimate abilities. This is the first MMO I can really remember doing something like this. However, the biggest takeaway from Warhammer, funny enough, comes from the PvE features. You've likely seen it in every major MMO since. Public questing. This was a feature Warhammer revolutionized. It allowed people to participate in group questing and have a share of loot at the end without actually having to be in the same group. It gave people an incentive to play together, even if they weren't grouped together. Each race and faction had a different take on public quests, and some of them were located in PvP areas, so you also had to deal with a possible green skin or dwarf running into your quest and causing havoc. So back to why the game failed, well, why did the game fail? In the next section of this video, I will detail the largest contributing factors to the failure of the game. Otherworldly hype. Warhammer Online's marketing campaign is frankly one of the best MMO campaigns of all time. This starts with the website that they had. It looked and felt like a Warhammer Universe website. It had Realm Wars tracking, a character profile tracker, as well as lore and class explanations for the classes and races in the game. Certainly this, plus the Warhammer IP being introduced in an MMO format are powerful factors in generating hype. But nothing is quite close to the impact a certain person had on the hype generator for Warhammer Online. Warhammer, been around for a long, long, long time. It's really exciting and it's really, really good if you're going to do an MMO because it does lots of really important things. The first thing it does, it's iconic in its look. They've had 23 years to get this right. We know what elves look like. We know how powerful orcs are. We know how gritty dwarves can be. So we've got to look 
that's dead important and we've been following it in the game. The second thing we need is an excuse to smash the living crap out of each other and we've got that. Pages, novels, thousands of pages of reasons why dwarves don't like the green skins and the dark elves don't like the high elves and humans don't like chaos, so that's great. But the third and most important thing if you're going to have a subscription based MMO is a perpetual war. You can't have an end. That would be bad and Warhammer helps us again. The whole thing is built so that there is no ending. There is just epic, heroic, perpetual struggle or any combination, a struggle that's epically heroic and that's what we're doing. We're taking that idea, we know how people can fight, we know what they look like, we know they're gonna smash each other to pieces. Pa Barnett hit the gaming world by storm and was sort of an enigma when he was introduced as the creative director for Warhammer Online. Barnett oozed charisma, but he was clearly a very passionate nerd himself. Both nerds and casual players could relate to the guy, because he spoke like he was some social savant, but with a complete nerdish undertone to it. Paul Barnett was a guy who could likely make soap sound exciting. Instead, he was given a well-established IP, Warhammer, that was relatively underutilized in the non-tabletop world and completely underutilized in the MMO space. Paul had books full of lore for the races and classes of Warhammer, and he was able to really explain this with the strength of his ability to orate. As a personal anecdote, Paul was the reason I found and was interested in Warhammer, because watching his videos on what Warhammer was and what Realm vs. Realm was really mesmerized me. I found myself watching all of his class and race breakdowns, eager to drink up any bit of information on the game that I could. I also played the game far after being let down by its overhype, perhaps because I am a bit of a masochist, but mostly because I loved the world that the game took place in and I thought that the PvP was fun. Having a widely successful marketing campaign sounds like a positive thing, right? Well, not when the product doesn't really fit what was being advertised. Have you ever bought a game that was nothing like you expected it to be no Man's Sky. and were thoroughly let down? Even if the game was good, it didn't fit what was described initially, so you were let down. Because when you advertise something as some otherworldly type of prestige, the only place your expectations can go when the game doesn't meet that hype is down. You have to keep marketing on a leash when you are advertising for a game. Adding flavor and charisma is the spice of life in advertisement. Just make sure you don't find yourself being a snake oil salesman and selling things that aren't really even in the game. People don't like to be misled. Performance issues and balance issues. Warhammer was a game that focused on Realm vs. Realm PvP, Destruction vs. Order. However, it's hard to have warfare on such a large scale when performance issues were so rampant, rampant upon launch and even years after. The game's engine was never very impressive, not from a performance or feel perspective, though it did manage to have things like siege weapons, unit collision to some extent. But people said that WoW was seen as the bastion of performance, and when you played WoW and then Warhammer, Warhammer undoubtedly felt clunkier in comparison. It also didn't, frankly, run as effectively. Clunky hurt new players trying the game out, for sure, but for the people who got used to it, wanting to participate in PvP content, they were then met with performance woes. So it's like you managed to slug through that mud part, because that's what it sort of felt like, the engine to some extent, it felt like you were walking through the mud. And then you think that you finally got to the water, time to rinse off, and then you get to the water and it's all muddy too. Trying to participate in large sieges was near impossible unless you had some monster PC, and even then you could barely scratch 20 FPS. I mean, it was a slideshow in some of these big battles, even if you had, which at the time, I couldn't even tell you what the premier graphics card was, but even if you had that, you still struggled. I personally used to play on an ancient computer that at best could have like 30 FPS if I was looking at the ground or something. And when I tried to PvP, I would just have like 15 FPS and would often freeze. When you have low and mid-tier computers that can barely even play the game, you alienate a large percentage of players. That's one thing that WoW did so effectively. The balance issues were also terrible. Warhammer had balance issues for years after its launch. 
At launch, you had Magus players pressing the Rift ability button and balling a bunch of people together, and people would just nuke that. My Mythic didn't really learn from the DAOC days. They seemed to let crowd control and CC very rampant. It, I thought crowd control was a cool feature of Warhammer, but when you don't put a very good cap of it or a very good CC reduction after you've been CC'd already, you just have massive CC fests. The Magus Rift ability, for example, it could pull people close into it, and then when you could combine it with other AoE abilities, it would just have this ball of death sucking people in. And then they also had this thing called a nuke group, which happened later in the game, where you would have a bunch of like bright wizards together, and they would run around spamming the same AoE nuke and just destroying people. Games are hard enough to balance in 1v1 situations, but when you take 10 of the same class and have them in the same fight, you have fights that can be easily exploited by specific types of groups and gimmicks. Part of this imbalance was because of the attempt at mirror classes. Instead of having direct mirror classes, Mythic tried to make each class really unique. Even if, say, the Chosen in the Night of the Blazing Stun had the same archetype and foundation for a class, the Chosen in nearly all iterations of the game was more focused on damage, while the Night of the Blazing Sun was more focused on CC. In some cases, you had a mirror class objectively better than the other. In most iterations, the Witch Hunter outperformed the Witch Elf because of its finisher abilities being ranged abilities, while the Witch Elf had melee-based finishers. This meant that more people wanted to play the Order than Destruction, or vice versa. This changed, obviously, as the game progressed. Balancing would change, people would do what's called X-Realming, which one side is doing well, they make another tune and start playing on that. And, and that's kind of unheard of in certain games, but not in Warhammer, because Tier 1 was the most balanced part of the game, and frankly one of the most fun parts, so people typically didn't mind having to remake characters. At one point I can remember, the Order ruled over almost every single server. The server I played on at the time was ruled by a clan named Ruin. I'm sure if people played the game, you remember Ruin. They used to have multiple clans because they had like a thousand members or something ridiculous at one point. And they would just run around in massive hundred person warbands, capping every single keep, and you, you would just get stomped if you played Destruction. During the same point, you had the Witch Hunter that was better than the Witch Elf, the Bright Wizard was better than the Sorcerer, etc. With only two factions, this means that the game could very easily get unfun when one side is dominating so heavily. Lack of content and cut content. Theme park MMOs are MMOs which are heavily reliant on content. This is why games like Lord of the Rings Online and World of Warcraft have had so many content expansions. Warhammer only had one real expansion and fairly few content patches. This is a game that ran for five years. The expansion it did have, called ARMS, added two classes that were cut from the beta portion of the game. Expansions that add cut content are rarely met with a positive reception. Consumers believe they are warranted or deserve that content already, so they're not really necessarily happy to see it. They're more of like, yeah, we know, we deserved that. The zone Call to Arms added was positively received, but Call to Arms was like most MMO expansions where they focus on adding new content without fixing prior content, so even if the new zone was cool, people were still complaining about the same old, same old. Lack of content was a weakness that affected Warhammer up until its ultimate demise. You can't have a game that's reliant on developer content, like a theme park game, and then not have an increase in developer content. Players don't have a strong way of affecting the content in a theme park game, like they would in a sandbox game for example, so they're very reliant on the developers of the game to provide them with more content, or at least fix the existing content. A third faction. How do you deal with one faction being more popular than the other? One faction stomping the other faction constantly, 70 to 30 ratios, something ridiculous. Well, you introduce a third faction. Mythic had experience with this, you would think they wouldn't make such a mistake, especially when in the beta version of the game, people complained about this. They said that this could possibly be a concern. Dark Age of Camelot, which is a Mythic game, had three factions. This was something Planetside also did well. You have three factions to prevent one faction from being too powerful. 
When the basis of the game is on war, in realm versus realm PvP, if one faction is more popular or powerful than the other, especially on a PvP server, it makes for a very boring game, especially when the winning side gets even more benefits and bonuses. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And then the losing side decides to change factions because they're, frankly they're tired of losing. And then the winning side gets even more powerful. The game initially talked about six factions, Greenskins, Elves, Dwarves, Humans, Chaos, Dark Elves. Now, these were never said to have been their separate factions per se, but we know the Warhammer universe can support multiple factions. You would think that Mythic would understand that maybe having two factions wasn't the best idea, especially when in their previous most popular Realm vs. Realm game, they didn't have two factions, they had three. If you have a third faction, problems as previously described don't happen, because as DAOC and Planetside demonstrated, if one faction gets too powerful, the other factions can always band together and take them out, or maybe just have some equal combat between each other. Warhammer's lore supported three factions. There could have been a Skaven faction. Skavens were a rat-like race that fought all of the factions in Warhammer. They were in the game, but not playable in any capacity until a later patch in the game, and even then it wasn't actually a third faction that was introduced, it was more of like a, a new class for both factions to play. A Skaven faction would add more content, another PvP opponent, and really help with the balancing and factions in the game, but likely weren't an option since Mythic seemed to have delusions that focusing on PvE content would be helpful to the game. Or maybe they just never had the resources. Likely a combination of both. If you are going to focus on PvP, go all in. War is coming. This was the slogan you heard or read when watching a Warhammer video or reading the Warhammer website. It was about war, siege weapons, realm versus realm, conquest, territorial warfare. Why was PvE such a large part of the game? I have no issues with PvE. However, making it a very important part of the game that focused on PvP was just strange. Why was raid gear more effective than some PvP gear? Why were raids even PvE focused? Why didn't we have raids that had PvP elements in them? The best quests in the game were quests that focused on PvP. Realm quests, kill quests, PvEVP quests were the best part of PvE. You would start in the game, in a PvE zone, have to go through these PvE areas without having any access to PvP yet until you reach a certain level. Now, you could theoretically run straight to the RVR lake in PvP or queue up for a scenario, but if the game was about war, why couldn't you spawn and then BAM, war is around you? Yes, there's things like gankers and griefers, but they could have integrated PvE with PvP more especially later on in the game where you have to repeatedly do quests in order to level, really. You, even though the game allows you to level up doing PvP, it's not really as effective as PvEing. The initial impression of Warhammer Online was that you could just level up doing PvP. It's one thing to level up doing PvP, and another to level up doing PvE and then PvP. One is like objectively better than the other. Sure, you can travel to Canada from Mexico by walking, but who actually wants to do that? No, most people are going to take the plane, right? Well, it's the same in Warhammer Online. How many people are actually going to PvP every single second in order to level while they're playing against other people in their tier who have PvE gear and PvE advantages? PvP should have been the main way of leveling in the game and PvE should have been supplemental, or at least just make them completely equal. Tier 1 in Warhammer was the most balanced and best experience in all of the game. There were little to no balance issues, lobbies fighting lobbies, and no abilities to be exploited and gimmicked in large groups. This was the part of the game you wanted your fan base to play the most, so why was PvE such a large part of it? I recently played the early game experience on a private server, and I was just taken aback at remembering how much PvE is even in the game, especially early on. It's, I'm very surprised by that. It's like, why is there so much PvE in this game? Either the game is about war, or it's about war and then quests, or quests and then war. You can have a middle ground by combining PvP elements and PvE elements like DAOC did in some instances, but having them as complete separate features 
felt really disconnected in a game about PvP and war. I mean, war is in the name. War Hammer. EA and its vice grip. Oh, EA. They were voted the worst company in America two years in a row. They've had their hands in tons of franchises, have more company takeovers and buyouts than I have words in this write-up. They're often seen as a villain in the video game world, and this is probably likely due to their strong focus on business over art. They have been caught tampering with review scores, supporting shady DRMs, and have rushed and killed a few notable games. Sure, some of the hate could be warranted, but some of it probably is a bit unwarranted, though EA ultimately has had their share of missteps. EA is a successful company because they know how to make money. Sadly, this can mean taking away what makes certain companies unique, the companies they end up buying out and taking over. Bioware and Mythic, for example, were bought by EA, and many would argue that their creativity suffered because of it. Publishers have nearly always been seen as a necessary evil, where small companies go to the big daddy publisher to help publish and distribute their game. Lately we have seen crowdfunding become a thing, where smaller companies are trying to go directly to the fans to get funding for the products. However, we haven't seen many of these be successful, so it still seems like publishers are still very much relevant. When EA bought Mythic, they certainly changed the focus of Warhammer Online and the company in general. This is rather evident in Mark Jacobs, a founder of the company, exiting shortly after the purchase of the company. Mark had initially said that business would continue as usual, which fans have now been programmed to ignore. It's mostly speculation to assume what changed. However, we can focus on Warhammer and its trajectory as a product. Warhammer was never a true failure. It was a commercial success. Although it didn't meet its initial expectations, it was still able to boast a 300k subscriber base almost as late as 2010. But EA didn't seem to treat it like it was successful, even though it had sold 1.2 million copies. That 300,000 subscriber base shrunk from 2009 to 2011 to a reported less than 50,000 players. But this made sense. The game was not getting any content patches or expansions. The game ran for five years and had one expansion during that time and probably less than three to four content patches. This is a stark contrast from Star Wars Galaxies from my previous video, which some would argue that the game was changed too much. Warhammer Online wasn't changed enough. The client was still clunky, their performance still suffered, and there was next to no new content introduced. MMOs are games which must have content added to them, otherwise eventually people get bored of playing the same thing over and over again, especially when the same thing is an unbalanced PvP experience. Even sandbox type games need new content introduced, or at least new features, and those games are more driven by players. The decision to make Warhammer a mostly theme park experience was a huge decision. But in order to support such a game, you need to do what WoW and Lortro did. Add constant expansions and content to the game. Warhammer Online needed an NGE. It needed a Final Fantasy XIV 2.0. It needed a Rift Upheaval patch. A WoW Cataclysm. Instead, it was given neglect. EA had Mythic merge with Bioware, likely in an attempt to get them to help or provide experience for their upcoming MMO, SW Tour. During SW Tour development, it's not coincidental that Warhammer suffered during this period of 2009 to 2012. Warhammer had potential, and people stood by the game despite it not having large changes for years. But people can only take so much neglect. EA might have the money to support your game, and the funding, but they have shown a severe lack in creativity or vision. It really seems like a place your company goes to die. Hopefully this isn't the case with Bioware, but with disappointing games like Dragon Age Inquisition, I fear that the company is more of the same from EA. Launching of unfinished games and lacking substance. Unfortunately, Mythic did see its death under EA. Hopefully Bioware doesn't share the same fate. EA is definitely the Scrooge of the video game world, and everyone hates Scrooge. EA Laos. In 2011, there was a figure only known as EA Laos. This person was an artist let go in a round of layoffs from Bioware Mythic. EA Laos wrote a scathing piece on his or her time with the company. EA Laos was rather ruthless in some of his or her opinions on SW Tour and the developers working on Warhammer Online. 
Although we can't really say EA Louse was a reason the game failed, I still figured it was relevant enough to bring up as a separate point. EA Louse was significant because it was the first time we heard the story of Warhammer Online from an inside source. This wasn't just protocol talk. This was anger. This was off the cuff. Louse accused Jeff Hickman, the lead producer of the game, of being nothing more than a yes man. Laos also accused Rob Denton, a co-founder of the company, as being controlling, and not really open to outside opinions, something not very good for a leader of a company. Laos said that Jacobs, the main force behind the company, had a rather hands-off approach in regards to meeting with the team. He was very much out on his own handling his own design philosophies. We don't really know what he was doing, but that's just how it was described. This was especially true after the company was acquisitioned by EA. Jacobs was said to have mutually parted with the company, but many people, including EA Laos, believed he was fired to have a more pro-EA leader. According to Laos, to divide his salary up, and because Rob Denton, the co-founder, stabbed him in the back or whatever, that probably was a little bit of projecting. Jacobs seemed to take the majority of the rap for the game, despite Laos disputing it should have been his co-founder, Rob Denton, who had far more control over the project. Jeff Hickman was a CSR rep who handled customer relations and was then promoted to handle the production of Warhammer Online with no previous experience in doing such. We don't know if EA Laos was completely right about all of these things, could have been spoiled grapes, but one thing EA Laos was right on, which is not really related to this video, was that SW Tour was most certainly a failure. It was a commercial failure in the sense that, well, I think Bioware said it was going to have 3 million subscribers in the first winter or something ridiculous like that, but that's that's a tangent. We don't know if EA Laos is right or wrong about any of this. He or she clearly had some inside information. I don't think all of it is false. I think we should take it with a grain of salt. And from the sounds of it, maybe Mark Jacobs was treated as a scapegoat. We'll never really know, but it's rather interesting to think about. Conclusion Warhammer Online was fun times for me. The PvP was memorable, and I really thought that the classes were great at feeling distinct and unique. The game went from its 800k subscribers to 300k and then 50k until it saw its eventual shutdown in 2013. But the game still has a loyal fanbase, as can be shown in its currently running EMU, or private server, known as Warhammer Return of Reckoning. I will link it in the description and put an annotation on screen. The server is able to boast as much as 1400 players on its server, averaging around 4 to 500 players, depending on when you play. EU times would be higher, 700 or so. But Warhammer in its original iteration is shut down, same as Mythic, the company that created it. Hopefully after watching this video you have a better understanding of why and how the game failed. Remember, the takeaway from these videos is the insight on the game and its failure. Hopefully, the knowledge to not let something like that happen again. I do not want people to pile on EA, though, if you want to, that's absolutely your prerogative. You'd probably have to get in line, though. Thanks for watching the video. For more Death of a Game videos, subscribe to my channel. I also have a newer series called What Blank Game Did Well, coming soon, where I will have shorter format videos focused on highlighting which games of all possible genres do or did well. If you like this video, please drop a like or a comment. Why you didn't or did like the video? Nerd Slayer out for the. Yeah!